Good morning. I won't bore you with too many announcements. You can refer to your bulletin. Just make a note. We've got our quarterly business meeting at the very end of, of worship. We'll, we'll enter into that session. It won't take long, but uh, just be prepared for that. Secondly, tonight, our Sunday night, Sunday afternoon activities begin. Um, children's Zip and Children's Choir. Our youth have something exciting. Please, my youth parents, y'all come get your youth here. You, my, my youth, my students, impact students, bring some friends. There's something exciting, but you got to come tonight to find out and see that. And our two studies are our women's study. I believe we're going through the parables of Jesus. And then we've got experiencing God going on as well. And if you've never been a part of that, let me, let me give a disclaimer here. I got four more workbooks available. All the other ones have been signed up for, but I've got four. They've already been paid for by, by someone. Um, come and see me if you want to be a part of this tonight. We'd love to have you, and I encourage you, if you've never gone through it, to be a part of that. Last but not least, I need to give you a little announcement here. Um, back in, this, back in the, the early fall, we made an announcement on a Wednesday night about a trip to Nicaragua. And it's kind, what's kind of happened is Well, good morning. It's raining. Did you notice? I don't know about y'all, but boy, we did not want to get up this morning. In fact, our radio did not, the radio station did not come on this morning. And if Carolyn had not awakened when she did, we probably wouldn't be here because we were asleep. And so we got up late. We had to hurry, hurry, hurry. It's good to see you here. Let's stand together as we sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name is wonderful. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord most high. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord most high. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord most high. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. She Jesus, my Lord, he is the mighty king, master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Adore him, his name is 
is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. At the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth at the name of Jesus at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth that every shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Y'all may be seated for a moment. Let me read you from the Word of God. Luke chapter 1, beginning verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, God's Word makes it so clear that He ordains life. He has already determined who is going to be coming into this world. Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday, and as you gather your hearts with me this morning, you know, we need to think about not only just praying again, we, we praise the Lord for... Um, Roe versus Wade being overturned this past year, but state by state, even, our, even in our own state, you know, there have been abortion laws overturned, and so we need to keep praying, keep praying for God to work and move through the legislators, through his people, and we need to be praying for those pregnancy centers, and I'm, I'm just really, really grateful for this church. We have, have taken upon ourselves to partner with a pregnancy center over in Florence, not just in prayer, but we actually have dedicated some of our budget to supporting them. And, and we also have some church members who are starting to be a part of volunteering and pouring ourselves into them. So would you gather your hearts with me this morning as we have just a prayer on this special day, this Sanctity of Life Sunday for life. Father, we thank you. You are creator. And your word makes it very, very clear that you are the one who breathes life into us. And your word also is very, very clear that you have ordained every life in the womb. And so, Father, we just continue to pray. We thank you, Lord, for last year the ruling of, of having a, a law that murdered so many innocent little babies in the wombs for so many decades. And so, Father, we just want to continue to pray that you would work and move, raise up your servants, raise up, Lord, your warriors in making a difference in those, those laws, those legislation. Father, we want to thank you for the pregnancy centers all around this nation and what the, the press doesn't often give attention to are those pregnancy centers being defaced, being threatened, vandalized. Father, we pray for your protection, for your anointing, for your favor as we continue to stand upon life. And Lord, help us, Lord, even outside of the womb, these babies that are brought in this world, raise up the church in adoption, in foster care, and Lord, doing our part to be Jesus in hands and feet and prayers, Father. But we just thank you for this special Sunday. We boldly stand upon your word, fighting for the rights of the unborn, fighting for those in the lives that you ordain, Lord, even to the minute, Lord, we leave this world. Life's not ours to take, even our own lives. You're the one who ordains our days. 
So, Father, please bless, anoint this special day. It may be a day, Lord, that we, we work and move and we make much of Jesus every day for the cause of life. For we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I read this past week that there are 4,200 religions in the world. Now, I don't know who counts all those religions, and I don't know if that's true or not. That's a lot of religions. That's a lot of people searching for something, and they're not finding it in those religions. But this is the fact that remains true. If there's 4,200 or however many there are religions in the world, the fact is, and the truth is, there's only one that has an empty tomb. And he is our Savior. He is our Lord. He's our rock, our shelter, our very own. He's our blessed Redeemer who reigns upon the throne. Let's stand together and sing. There is a fountain. Who is the king? There is a fountain, who is the king, victorious warrior and lord of everything, my rock, my shelter, my very own, blessed redeemer, who upon the throne there is a fountain who is the king victorious warrior and lord of everything my rock my shelter said Redeemer who reigns upon the throne. There is a fountain who is the King, victorious warrior and Lord of shelter, my very own, blessed Redeemer, who reigns upon the throne. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything. Thank you for the sun and the rain you're sending today. Thank you for everything we have, because everything we have is a blessing from you. And especially thank you for sending your son Jesus, who died for our salvation. We now have an opportunity to return a small portion of the blessings you've given us. Take these tithes and offerings, use them to further your kingdom, and glorify your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
if you've got your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 6 for me. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 5 in just a moment. But as you're turning and finding Matthew 6, verse 5. I've lived here in Darlington for almost seven and a half years now. And I've driven basically every road, every highway, every street there is to drive in Darlington. But you know what? Even after driving seven years all over, I still find myself noticing new landmarks, new features in different houses, little different characteristics I've never noticed before. My, my son and I were driving on 52 about two weeks ago. You know, I've driven 52 numerous times every time of year, every time during the day. And there was, I just noticed something for the first time, uh, something about a building, something, some landmark I never noticed before. Now, now most of you all have lived here a whole lot longer than I have. And I wonder if that ever happens to you. You're driving along a familiar place and you notice something for the first time you've never noticed before. My point is that familiarity can cause us to be numb, numb to notice different features, little th things and details. And that is especially true as Christians in reading God's Word and familiar passages that you and I know by heart. Um, think about John 3.16. We all know it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have, what, everlasting or eternal life. And the passage that we are still in this morning in Matthew chapter 6 is a passage that most of us have referred to as the Lord's Prayer well, more accurately, it should be referred to as the disciples' model prayer. You all know this passage. Say it with me real quick off the top of your head. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forevermore. Amen. We're going to continue to look at this passage this morning, Matthew 6, verses 5 to 15. And we're walking through the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday mornings. And we started last week looking at this passage. And there's just so much to unpack in this model prayer. As I've told you all last week, I've preached this before. I've preached it a different way. I've broken it up in different ways. If I was to preach this in two weeks, I'd probably preach it a different way. There is just so much deep truth and, and jewels and, and treasures in God's Word. And so this morning we're going to continue looking at this passage, but let's first read with me. I'm going to read Matthew 6, verses 5 to 15. I'm in the New American Standard. You can listen along or look at your own translation. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 5. Jesus says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you that they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Uh, so do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven the, our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your holy, inerrant, perfect word. And Father, our prayer this morning is that your word will have its perfect way in our hearts and our lives. Prepare, Lord, this time. Open our eyes, open our ears. 
as we hear your word, help us to do your word. Let your word flow and live through us this time. And I pray, Father, that we would rely on the power of your word and not on the cleverness of man's word. For it's Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, in the context here, remember the very beginning of chapter 6, Jesus is telling his disciples, he's saying, hey, don't practice your righteousness before others. And then what this, this practicing righteousness looks like, he begins to give three examples of what this looks like. In verse 3, he says, when you give to the poor, when you give alms. Verse 5, he says, when you pray. Now, next week, we're going to look at fasting. In verse 16, he says, when you fast. So he says, he, he assumes that his followers will pray. And again, prayer at its simplest form is a conversation with God. As Tim Keller said in his book, Prayer, he said that prayer is a personal, communicative response to the knowledge of God. A personal, communicative response to the knowledge of God. And last week we began looking at this passage. And remember, Jesus gives us three primary ways that we, we pray as disciples. And then the last subpoint there, we do this with five subpoints. Now, those of you who were here last week, let me refresh our memories. Those of you who weren't, I'll bring up the part where we left off, and then we'll continue on together. All right, so this is where we, we started last week. Number one, Jesus tells us that when, that when we pray as his, Christ, his followers, we are to pray in the secret place. We are to pray in the secret place. Verses 5 to 6, remember he says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. And remember the hypocrite was a, a term for a stage actor. And they put this mask on. He says, don't be like, like those who put on an act. They like to pray in the synagogues, in the streets, very publicly. He says, when they do, they've got the reward. But he says, but you, you, my followers, he says, when you pray, Go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your father who's in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, he's not forbidding public prayers. Matter of fact, I'll go far, so far as to say if that you're a Christian, you're uh, proclaim Jesus Christ, you need to be heard in some public way with your prayers, whether you're praying out loud at your dinner table, whether you're praying in, in, a, in a prayer group, whether you're, you're praying with, with someone. We need to pray out loud. But what he's saying here is that every Christian, every follower, we need to have that, that secret place too. We need to have that secret place. Maybe that secret place in our car where we're talking to him. Maybe that secret place in, in our, our inner closet. Maybe out back in our backyard. We need to have that secret place in prayer with God, number one. But number two, when we as Christ followers pray, he says we're to pray in a straightforward way. We're to shoot straight. Verse 7 to 8, he says when you're praying... Do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. They, they just talked and talked and talked. They thought the more words they said, the more likely their prayers would be answered. He says, don't be like them. That's the wrong way to pray. He wants us to shoot straight just as you would talk to your spouse, your friend, your child. Tell God what's on your heart, what's on your mind. Lay it before him in a straightforward way. All right, but third, we also saw that we as Christians are to pray with utter dependence. Our, our prayer should be utter dependently, dependent upon God. And this model prayer, verses 9 to 15, it's a prayer of utter dependence. It's a, it's a prayer that we acknowledge our utter dependence on God, all right? Now, last week, we looked at two of the ways that we pray with utter dependence, all right? There were two ways that we, we looked at. The first way that we pray with utter dependence, we acknowledge God's holiness, we pray dependently by acknowledging God's holiness. Verse 9, it's right there. He says, pray in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now remember, God's in, in heaven. That's the holy, perfect place. Talk about a holy place. And it says, hallowed be his name. Now, that, that we, God's already holy, so he can't become holy. We don't pray for God to be holy. But what that means is we pray that he be treated as holy. God, I'm praying that you'll be treated as holy through my life, through the lives around me. And remember, as the reformer um, uh, Martin Luther said, how do we hallow his name? When our life and our doctrine are truly Christian. When our life and our doctrine are truly Christian, that's how we practically 
hallow his name. We acknowledge his holiness. All right, but the second way that we so we utterly depend on God in prayer, we acknowledge God's sovereignty and his dominion. We acknowledge his sovereignty and his dominion. Verse 10, look, it's right there. Remember, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, he's saying your, your dominion, you have complete rule and sovereignty in heaven. Lord, you want it done here on earth, in, around, and through us as your followers. Have your own way. We sing what? Have, have thine own way, right? Have thine own way. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God's sovereignty, God's dominion, we acknowledge it. All right, that's where we left off last week. Three more ways that we'll see that we are to pray in other dependence upon God, all right, under this third point. All right, third, subpoint C. We pray with other dependence when we acknowledge our physical needs. We pray with utter dependence upon God when we acknowledge our physical needs. Verse 11, he says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, the word bread is used in so many different ways and slang in our world. You know, a few decades ago, people would use the word bread for money, right? You know, hey, how much bread did you bring home, right? In the early 70s, there was a soft rock band called Bread. They had a lot of big hits on the radio. They actually went, the lead singer and, and songwriter, David Gates, went to my parents' high school. My dad used to play bread. And I remember as a little, a little child hearing these beautiful songs. And there was one song that just grabbed me. It was a song called Aubrey. And I said, man, if I ever have a daughter, I'm going to name her Aubrey. There's the rest of the story for you there. But he's not talking about a, a, a rock band. He's not talking about um, money. He's talking about our physical needs. At the heart of it, this verse in the Greek literally translates, give us today tomorrow's bread. Give us today tomorrow's bread. He's talking about providing our needs and not, not our greeds, right? God, God cares about you and I having food. He cares about us having roof over our head. He cares about us having clothes on our backs. He cares about those things. And we've got an awesome God who is, no matter what the prayer request, nothing's too big for God to handle and nothing's too small for him to care about. And we forget that sometimes. Sometimes I'll hear people say, man, I, I feel so guilty about praying for this. No, if it's on your heart, pray for it. God wants you and I to lay it before him. But he wants us to pray for our needs and not our greeds. Now, a great passage, I didn't include this on my PowerPoint, so if you're taking notes, write this passage down. Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9. Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9. Let me read this for you real quick. This is an awesome, awesome prayer in praying in this way about our physical needs. Remember the words of Agur, Proverbs 30. He says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. He's saying, Lord, provide my needs, not my greeds. Lord, don't give me too much where I forget about you and I say, who is God? But Lord, don't give me too little where I'm tempted to steal, profane your name, blaspheme your name through my life. We acknowledge our physical needs that God wants us to provide our needs. doesn't mean that you and I need to pray for a Mercedes or a BMW, but if we need a car, God, I need transportation. Please provide it, our physical needs. And ultimately, we need to also pray for our spiritual needs, too. God, give me this day your spiritual bread that I feast on your word, that I've got a hunger for your word. And, of course, ultimately, it all points to the ultimate bread, the bread of life. And that is who? Jesus. John 6, verse 51, Jesus says what? He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And Jesus never disappoints us. Father, give us this day the bread of tomorrow. All right, moving on. Fourth way that we pray with utter dependence. We acknowledge our sinfulness. We acknowledge our sinfulness. Verses 12 to 13, there is this theme of acknowledging our sinfulness. Verse 12, he says, and forgive us our debts. Some translations say transgressions. Talk about our sins. He's talking about us acknowledging that we are sinners 
before a holy God. There are some who pray this prayer mindlessly. Oh, Father, who art in heaven, our kingdom come, all will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And some, it's so easy to start praying about this, this section. Oh, Lord, forgive us our, our trespasses, our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us, those debtors. And one of the signs of spiritual maturity and the signs of spiritual growth is coming before God and acknowledging our sinfulness. Even as Christians, hey, we're saved, we're born again, we're, we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, we are righteous in his eyes, but we are still sinners who still need to confess our sins. And that's a sign we come before him and say, God, forgive me the sinner. That's at the heart here. And then notice it goes on to say, verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation. Does this mean that God can lead us in temptation? No, because James 1.13 says, go it, God doesn't tempt us. This is what he's praying for. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying that we pray, God, don't allow me to come under the sway of temptation that will overpower me and cause me to sin. Father, don't allow us to come under the sway of temptation that will overpower us and cause us to sin. Temptation's not a bad thing in itself. You go to Matthew chapter 4, temptation molded the life and ministry of Jesus. Remember the devil tempting him in Matthew chapter 4. But we need to remember that all of us are not above falling. Every one of us are sinners who can be easily tempted and taken away by our sins. Think about Peter. Remember Peter told Jesus, Lord, I'll never, I'll never deny you. What did Jesus say to him? Peter, you're going to deny me three times for the crow. Every one of us is tempted to fall. No one is above falling. Real quickly, R. Kent Hughes, a pastor who wrote a great commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he tells a story that he was in college. He had three college roommates, and these men were just so on fire for the Lord. And of all those three roommates, there was one in particular he was so close to. He said if there was just a, a, a champion for Jesus, it was this man. He just loved the Lord. He was bold in sharing his faith. And this man was, was going to become an evangelist. And he did become an evangelist for a big, huge organization nationally. But long story short, there were some struggles with his wife and his family. He ended up leaving that organization. He took another job when there was a lot of temptations. And R. Kent Hughes tells the pain of receiving an invitation in the mail from his friend, inviting him to his wedding of his new fiance upon a, upon a yacht. Folks, I know story after story of some of the most godly men and women, seminary brothers. You all know stories too. No one is a beyond temptation. And that's why we have to learn how to pray spiritual protection over ourselves. Let me give you just a quick little application here. Preacher, what does this look like? Let me, show, let me tell you. Every single day, I pray over Dorothy, Trevor, and Aubrey, and I go through Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't know the spiritual armor, memorize it. And, and folks, and, and, I, and I picture this in my mind, and I pray, Father, put on each of our chests the breastplate of righteousness, and I'm picturing that happening. Lord, wrap around each of our waists the belt of truth. Father, put on each of our feet the gospel shoes of peace. Put on each of our heads the helmet of salvation. Each of our right hands, Lord, put in the sword of the Spirit. And I'm, I'm picturing this sword in each of our hands. And Lord, put it in our left hands, put in the shield of faith. And then I pray, Lord, surround each of us with a multitude of heavenly hosts. I picture those, those army of angels, Luke chapter 2, when the, when the, the shepherds are there. Um, I picture the chariots of fire. Lord, surround us with chariots of fire, the, the story of Elisha. And then finally, I pray, Lord, cover each of us in the blood of Jesus Christ, protecting us from demonic activity. Now, some people might say, you're, that, you're kind of strange, that's a kook. I don't care. I don't care. I'd rather have people say that I'm weird and strange for picturing the word of God being prayed over my family than to try to worry about, well, I don't, I don't want to come out as weird and let the enemy just have his own way in stealing, killing, and destroying my family. I'm very passionate about any man who goes into the ministry and pulpit. He better be a man praying for his family every day. And every Christian, if you're married, you need to be praying for your spouse every day. If you're a parent, you need to be praying for your children every day. That's spiritual protection. If you're a grandparent, 
and, 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 and your children aren't walking with the Lord, very, you better be praying for your grandchildren then, interceding on behalf of them. Because, folks, we have an enemy who's real. And he goes on to say that. He says, deliver us from the evil one. Now, the New American Standard says evil, but the better translation is the evil one. Some of your translations say that. Because he's talking about the devil. He's talking about Satan who is real. We need to be utterly dependent for spiritual protection. And don't think of temptation just in a sensual way. Temptation could be some sin. It could be gluttony. It could be a drug. It could be even denying the Lord. There was a story from centuries ago about two men, two Christians. They were sentenced to be burned at the stake under evil Queen Mary. And one of these men was very bold, and he said, I'm not afraid to die. He says, you know, I'm ready, man. Those flames hit me. I'm going to be proclaiming Jesus. I'm not afraid of these flames and death. But the other man was terrified. And he was asking the other man, he says, please pray for me because I'm sensitive to, to, to suffering. I'm scared to death of, of fire burning my body. The first man chided him and, and rebuked him and said, man, you need to, to man up. Man, you got nothing to be afraid of praying that way. Well, the next morning, when it came, came time to either proclaim Christ or deny him, the, the big, bold, strong man who had been boasting, he denied Christ. He was let go. He lived the rest of his life as a reprobate, denying Christ. But that second man who had been so scared, so timid, he had a renewed confidence and a joy and a boldness, and there he was in those flames just singing and praising the Lord. And that's the kind of dependence upon the Lord he wants us to have when it comes to temptation. Lord, please, God, give me the boldness and courage to not deny you, to not, not deny you when the time comes when I'm tempted to. And God's Word gives us this great promise that he will not tempt us beyond what we're capable of, of being tempted. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Great, great verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. And then you have that doxology at the very end of verse 13. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Some translations have it in bracket because some manuscripts, the earliest ones don't have it in there. Some have it in there. Hey, it's, it's a doxology to God. God's word backs us praising him through a doxology. We utterly depend upon God when we acknowledge our sinfulness. We are sinners in need of forgiveness. We are sinners capable of being tempted. All right, last but not least, fifth and finally, we pray in utter dependence when we acknowledge our need for grace. We acknowledge our need for grace. Our need for grace. Now, verses 14 to 15, some preachers include it in part of the prayer. Some keep it separate. I've preached it separately before. But because verse 13, he says, and what, forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, our debtors. It's that same connection. Listen to verses 14 to 15 first. He says, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Here's the issue here. It's about grace. Now, some <coughs> mistakenly say, well, it says right there it's conditional. If we don't forgive, God won't forgive us. Well, it's not what he's saying. The bigger issue, grace received, grace given. <coughs> grace received, grace given. That's the, the primary point here. As we've been given that same grace, we've tasted it, we've been forgiven, how much more should we forgive? doesn't mean that we don't struggle. Understand, folks, forgiveness is hard, and some of us, when we struggle with it, he's not talking about that. Those who, who, who adamantly say, oh, I'm not going to forgive, or I'll forgive, but I don't forget. Well, that's not real forgiveness. But if we will acknowledge, God, please help me to forgive. I truly forgive. I'm struggling with it. Grace received, grace given. And there's something powerful about God's grace. 
Tim Keller, I mentioned earlier, he wrote the best book I've ever read on prayer. It's Prayer by Tim Keller. It's an awesome book about prayer. It helps you understand prayer. It's very practical. He tells a story about a man who came to see him who was going through a lot of guilt. The man had had an extramarital affair years before. His wife never found out. His wife ended up dying. Never, he never confessed. She never knew. And he was eaten up with all this guilt because his wife had stood by him in his, his time of health issues. He had lost his job and, and his career went to pot. And he was just eaten up with guilt about did God truly forgive him? He really didn't feel like he was sincere about asking for forgiveness. And Pastor Keller said this. He said, why would Jesus have died only for extramarital affairs and not for hard hearts? And so he challenged the man to ask God to forgive him of his callous heart. Just say, ask God to forgive you for your callous heart. And you know what happened? The man had a breakthrough when he realized that God has sent Jesus to die, not only for that sin he committed, but also for his, his lack of repentance, his casualness. It transformed him. It changed him. It bring, uh, brought a, a breakthrough. Because the deep realizations of sin lead to greater assurances of his grace. When we truly repent and ask God, forgive me. Forgive me even, Lord. I want to repent. Help me in my callous heart. And we recognize that grace. It's powerful. Grace received. Grace given. Jesus says to every follower of his, he says, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, when I pray. And he calls his disciples, his followers, to pray with this utter dependence upon him, to pray straightforwardly, to pray in that secret place. Pastor Steve Gaines, pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, he made a statement, I heard a few years ago, that has not left me and has just, as I, I've kept this before me because it's really resonated with me, and this is what he said. A day without prayer is a wasted day. A day without prayer is a wasted day. And we're still in the infancy of this new year. 2023 and we've got a whole lot more days ahead of us than we do behind us in this year would we resolve to not waste this year you say preacher how do i not waste the year we'll, we'll not waste your days and how do we not waste the day by not letting the day go by without dependent prayer truth of utter dependence upon God in prayer. It's at the heart of the good news, the gospel message. You see, we are utterly dependent upon God for eternal salvation. I mean, folks, we are lost. We are headed to eternal hell. We have a death sentence. Every one of us, because we are sinners. We are those who have trespassed against God. We are debtors. We are in debt because of our sins. There's nothing you and I can do about it. We're doomed. But God, in his love, in his grace, in his mercy, did something about it. He sent his son into this world, perfect, holy God, perfect man he was, lived the perfect life we should have lived. He went on a cross and he died the death that you should have died, I should have died. He was buried and on a third day, God raised him from the dead, proving he is who he says he is, the son of God, the lamb of God, the Messiah. And 40 days he walked around the earth. Hundreds of people saw him. They talked to him. They touched him. And on that 40th day, he ascended to the right hand of the Father where he sits today, ready to receive anyone. But everyone must respond. There's a response required. We just can't sit there and say, okay, yeah, Jesus died for me. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. He calls us to acknowledge that we're sinners. Saying, God, holy God, I've sinned against you. I am a debtor. I am a transgressor. Forgive me of my sins. Father, I, I repent, which means to turn away, change my direction, change my mind, and I turn to you. I throw myself upon you. And the Bible says we believe in our hearts that God raised Christ from the dead. We confess with our mouths Jesus Christ is Lord. We are born again and saved, and there is no other way, as Jeff said a moment ago, all these religions, 
Christianity is the only way. That's, it's, it's easy when I hear somebody say, man, man people, somebody's asking me, how do I know Christianity is the, the right religion? That's easy. Because every single religion is about what we can do, what I can do to try to earn my way to get to heaven. Christianity is the only one that God's done it. It is finished. Now live. Maybe your greatest need today is just to come and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe today's the day of salvation. Just to come and let others know you've received Christ, you're saved. Maybe others of you are saved. Maybe you're born again, but maybe you need to come and repent. So I said a moment ago that part of being a Christian is to ask his forgiveness, acknowledge that we've sinned against God, we've sinned against others. Maybe our time of invitation might be to take that next step of faith, maybe in obedience to be to join this church body and membership, maybe to take that next step of obedience and believer's baptism. Maybe you need to come and just lay a prayer at this altar. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you. I've got prayer warriors all across this sanctuary. If I've got Christian sisters, I've got some great prayer warriors of sisters to come pray with them. Christian brothers, I've got brothers who will come pray with you. But I want to have a word of prayer for you and I in this special holy time as we, we do business with God. That, that's what our invitation time is. It's doing business with God. So I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we get ready to enter into this time. Would you be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's movement in your life and the lives around you in this special holy moment we have? Our Father, our Heavenly Father, holy is your name. And Father, our desire is to live in such a way that we do hallow your name in our lives and what we believe about you in our doctrine. Father, give us this day. We thank you for providing our physical needs. Help us to depend on you for every need, not our greeds. Father, being sinners that we are, we need to be honest and right with you and give those sins to you. And we ask that you would protect us and help us that we're not led into those easy ways we could be tempted. But deliver us, Lord, especially from the evil one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And Father, we acknowledge your kingdom come, your will, your rule, your dominion to be done in, around, and through us in our lives, our families, the places that you've put us. Help us to further your kingdom. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We acknowledge the grace you've given towards us. Help us to disperse that grace to those around us and that same forgiveness you've given to us. And now, Father, we acknowledge this other dependence that we need you. So move us, lead us, guide us. Show us what it is that we need to take action steps in this time of doing business with you. For we offer ourselves in this time, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Would you please stand as we have a time of response. Would you come as the Holy Spirit leads you through this morning? Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head? For sinners such as I At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Thus might I hide my blushing face While Calvary's cross appears Dissolve my heart in thankfulness And melt my eyes to tears At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I 
myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. One of the joyous moments for me as pastor is when we see God just bring somebody into himself to unite with us as a church body. And uh, Sarah, I'm going to have you come stand by me for just a moment. Come on up. Come on up. You know, Sarah uh, came here a few months ago. When was that? Was that like back in October? When, that was last yeah, fall. Yeah, yeah. It was November, wasn't it, right? And, and she just moved here, and she just instantly has just be, been just a joiner in, in, in Sunday school, being a part of a worship service. Um, her and I had a conversation this past week about her faith journey and how the Lord has saved her, and she's gone through believer's baptism, and she's been faithful at Langston Baptist in Conway, South Carolina. So she is coming this morning to unite with us um, in our church body and membership. So knowing of my time with her and just clear of her, her, her uh, salvation and her obedience to the Lord, I ask you as a church body, if you would just affirm her joining us in membership by transfer of, of letter, would you just give me a hearty amen? Amen. All right. Thank you, Sarah. You guys can go ahead and sit back over there. Uh, we, we do have to go back into the business session, but I want to encourage y'all, when we finish this business session, which will be very, very, very short, y'all go by and just greet Sarah and just let her know how much you appreciate her being a part of this church body. So, John, as you come up, I'll lead us in a quick prayer in this time. Father, I thank you for um, the organization and the structure of your, your church. We ask for your wisdom and your favor and hand upon our brother John and as he leads us in this time of just um, doing the business you've called us to in, uh, Lord, the, the structure of your church. We give you ourselves in this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 